Lesson Clips, High Quality Lessons, in Bite-Sized Form Thomas Wentworth, 1st Earl of Stafford, was an English statesman and a major figure in the period leading up to the English Civil War. He served in Parliament and was a supporter of King Charles I. From 1632 to 1640, he was Lord Deputy of Ireland, where he established a strong authoritarian rule. Recalled to England, he became a leading advisor to the king, attempting to strengthen the royal position against Parliament. When Parliament condemned Wentworth to death, Charles reluctantly signed the death warrant, and Wentworth was executed. Early life. Wentworth was born in London. He was the son of Sir William Wentworth of Wentworth Woodhouse near Rotherham, a member of an old Yorkshire family, and of Anne, daughter of Sir Robert Atkins of Stowell, Gloucestershire. He was educated at St. John's College, Cambridge, and became a law student at the Inner Temple in 1607, and in 1611 was knighted. He married firstly Margaret, daughter of Francis Clifford, Earl of Cumberland, and Grisold Hughes. Early Parliamentary Career Wentworth entered the English Parliament in 1614 as Yorkshire's representative in the Adult Parliament, but it was not until the Parliament of 1621 in which he sat for the same constituency that he took part in debate. His position was ambivalent. He did not sympathize with the zeal of the popular party for war with Spain, favored by George Villiers, first Duke of Buckingham, James I's foremost advisor and favorite, but James's denial of the rights and privileges of Parliament seems to have caused Wentworth to join in the vindication of the claims of the House of Commons, and he supported the protestation uh, which dissolved the third Parliament of James. In 1622, Wentworth's first wife, Margaret Clifford, died. Wentworth, according to his friends, was deeply grieved by her death, but in February 1625 he married Arabella Halls, daughter of John Halls, first Earl of Clare, and Anne Stanhope, a marriage which was generally believed to be a true love affair on both sides. He represented Pontefract in the Happy Parliament of 1624, but appears to have taken no active part. He expressed a wish to avoid foreign complications and to do the first business of the Commonwealth. In the first Parliament of Charles I in June 1625, Wentworth again represented Yorkshire and showed his hostility to the proposed war with Spain by supporting an, a motion for an adjournment before the House proceeded to business. He opposed the demand for war subsidies made on Buckingham's behalf after the death of James I. Buckingham had become First Minister to Charles, and after Parliament was dissolved in November, he was made High Sheriff of Yorkshire, a position which excluded him from the Parliament which met in 1626. Yet he had never taken up an attitude of antagonism to the King. His position was very different from that of the regular opposition. He was anxious to serve the Crown, but he disapproved of the King's policy. In January 1626, Wentworth asked for the presidency of the Council of the North, and was favorably received by Buckingham, but after the dissolution of the Parliament, he was dismissed from the Justiceship of the Peace and the office of Custos Rotolorum of Yorkshire, which he had held since 1615, probably because he would not support the court in forcing the country to contribute money without a parliamentary grant. In 1627, he refused to contribute to the forced loan and was subsequently imprisoned. The Petition of Right and its Aftermath In 1628, Wentworth was one of the more vocal supporters of the Petition of Right, which attempted to curve the power of the king. Once Charles had grudgingly accepted the petition, Wentworth felt it was appropriate to support the crown, saying, quote, The authority of a king is the keystone which closeth up the arch of order and government. He was consequently branded a turncoat. In the Parliament of 1628, Wentworth joined the popular leader, leaders in resistance to arbitrary taxation and imprisonment, but tried to obtain his goal without offending the crown. He led the movement for a bill which would have secured the liberties of the subject as completely as the petition of right afterwards did, but in a manner less offensive to the king. The proposal failed because of both the uncompromising nature of the parliamentary party and Charles's stubborn refusal to make concessions, and the leadership was snatched from Wentworth's hand by John Eliot and Edward Coke. Later in the session, he quarreled with Eliot because Wentworth wanted to come to a compromise with the Lords so as to leave room for the King to act unchecked in special emergencies. On 22nd July 1628, not long after the prorogation, Wentworth was created Baron Wentworth and received the promise of the presidency of the Council of the North at the next vacancy. This implied no change of principle. He was now at variance with the parliamentary party on two great subjects of policy, disapproving both of the intention of Parliament to take the powers of the executive and also of its inclination toward Puritanism. When once the 
breach was made, it naturally grew wider, partly from the energy each party put into its work and partly from the personal animosities which arose. As yet, Wentworth was not directly involved in the government of the country. However, following the assassination of Buckingham in December 1628, he became Viscount Wentworth, and not long afterward President of the Council of the North. In the speech delivered at York on taking office, he announced his intention, almost in the words of Francis, Francis Bacon, of doing his utmost to bind up the prerogative of the crown and the liberties of the subject in indistinguishable union. Whoever, he said, ravels forth into questions the right of a king and of a people shall never be able to wrap them up again into the comeliness and order he found them. His tactics were the same as those he later practiced in Ireland, leading to the accusation that he planned to centralize all power with the executive at the expense of the individual in defiance of constitutional liberties. The parliamentary session of 1629 ended in a breach between the king and parliament, which made the task of a moderator hopeless. Wentworth had chosen had to choose between either helping the House of Commons dominate the king or helping the king to dominate the House of Commons. He, he chose the latter course, throwing himself into the work of repression with characteristic energy and claiming that he was maintaining the old constitution and that his opponents in parliament were attempting to alter it by claiming supremacy for parliament. From this time on, he acted as one of the two principal members, the other being the Archbishop William Laud of Canterbury, uh, in a team of key royal advisers, the Thorough Party, during an 11-year period of total monarchical rule without Parliament, known as both the personal rule and the 11-year tyranny, Lord Deputy of Ireland. Wentworth became a Privy Councillor in November 1629. On 12th January 1632, he was made Lord Deputy of Ireland, arriving in Dublin in July the following year. He had recently suffered the loss of his beloved second wife Arabella in childbirth. Despite his genuine grief for Arabella, his third ma marriage to Elizabeth Rhodes in 1632 was also a happy one, but through a strange lapse of judgment, he did not announce it publicly for almost a year, by which time damaging rumours about the presence of a young woman in his house, who was reputed to be his mistress, had gained wide circulation. Wedgwood remarks that it was typical of Wentworth to be oblivious to the bad impression which actions like this might make on the public. Gossip later linked uh, his name to that of Eleanor Loftus, daughter-in-law of Lord Chancellor Loftus, but although a warm friendship existed between them and her death in 1639 caused him much grief, there is no evidence that their relationship went, went beyond friendship. In Ireland, Wentworth had to deal with people who had not arrived at national cohesion and amongst whom English colonists had been from time to time introduced, some of them, like the early Norman settlers, being Roman Catholics, whilst the latter, um, whilst the latter importations stood aloof and preserved their Protestantism. In his government here, he proved to be an able ruler. The Lord Deputy of Ireland, wrote Sir Thomas Rowe, to Elizabeth of Bohemia, doth great wonders and governs like a king, and hath taught the kingdom to show us an example of envy by having parliaments and knowing wisely how to use them. He reformed the administration, summarily dismissing the inefficient English officials. He succeeded in so manipulating the parliaments that he obtained the necessary grants and secured their cooperation in various useful legislative enhancements. He started a new victualating trade with Spain, promoted linen manufacture, and encouraged the development of the resources of the country in many directions. The court of Castle Chamber, the Irish counterpart of the Star Chamber, which up to that time had only operated intermittently, was transformed into a regular and efficient part of the Irish administration. Customs duties rose from a little over £25,000 in 1633-34 to £57,000 in 1637-38. Wentworth raised an army, put an end to piracy, installed life into the Church of Ireland, and rescued church property. His strong administration reduced the tyranny of the wealthy over the poor, yet these measures were all carried out by arbitrary methods which made them unpopular. Their aim was not the prosperity of the Irish, but the benefit of the English exchequer, um, and Wentworth suppressed the trade in cloth, lest it, quote, lest it should be a means to prejudice the staple commodity of England. Castle Chamber, like its model Star Chamber, was accused of brutal and arbitrary proceedings. Uh, individual cases of unfairness included those of Robert Esmond, a ship's captain and cousin of Lawrence Esmond, L Lord Esmond, accused of customs evasions, whom Wentworth was alleged to have assaulted, so causing his death. Lord Chancellor Loftus and Lord 
Mount Norris, the last of whom Wentworth caused to be sentenced to death to obtain the resignation of his office, and then pardoned. Uh, promises of legislation such as the concessions known as the Graces were not kept. Wentworth ignored Charles's promise that no colonists would be awarded land to the detriment of Catholic landholders in Connaught. In 1635, he raked up an obsolete title, the grant of the 14th century of Connaught to Lionel of Antwerp, whose heir Charles was, and insisted upon the grand jury's finding verdicts for the king. One county only, County Galway, resisted, and the confiscation of Galway was effected by the court of the Exchequer, while Wentworth fined the sheriff a thousand pounds for summoning a, such a jury, and cited the jurymen to the castle chamber to answer for their offence. In Ulster, the arbitrary confiscation of the property of the city companies aroused dangerous animosity against the government. His actions in Galway led to a clash with the powerful Burke family, headed by the aging Richard Burke, Earl of Clanricade. Clanricade's death was said by some to have been hastened by the clash. Wentworth, on hearing these reports, said he could hardly be blamed for the fact that Clanricade was nearly seventy. It was, however, unwise to have made an enemy of the new Earl, Alec Burke, fifth Earl of Clanricade, who, through his mother, Francis Walsingham, had powerful English connections. Clanricade's half-brother, Robert Devereux, third Earl of Essex by 1641, was to become one of Wentworth's, who became Earl of Stafford in 1640, most implacable em enemies. Wentworth made many enemies in Ireland, but none more dangerous than Richard Boyle, Earl of Cork, the most powerful of the, quote, new English magistrates. A more diplomatic man than Wentworth would no doubt have sought Cork's friendship, but Wentworth saw Cork's great power as a threat to the Crown's central authority, and was determined to curb it. He prosecuted Lord Cork in Castle Chamber for misappropriating the, fun the funds of Eugle College, and ordered him to take down the tomb of his first wife in St. Patrick's Cathedral, Dublin. Cork, a patient and implacable enemy, worked quietly for Wentworth's downfall, and in 1641 recorded calmly in his diary that Wentworth, by then the Earl of Stafford, had been beheaded, quote, as he well deserved. Toward the native Irish, Wentworth had no notion of developing their qualities by process by a process of natural growth. His only hope for them lay in converting them into Englishmen as soon as possible. They must be made English in their habits, in their laws, and in their religion. Quote, I see plainly that so long as this kingdom continues popish, they are not a people for the crown of England to be confident of, he wrote. Although staunchly Protestant, he showed no desire to persecute Catholics. As J.P. Kenyon remarks, it was understood that so long as Catholics remained the great majority of the population, there would be, uh, have to be a much larger degree of toleration than was necessary in England. He was prepared to give tacit recognition to the Catholic hierarchy, and even, uh, and, and even gave an interview to Archbishop Thomas Fleming of Dublin, whose homely face, plain dress, and lack of ostentation made a poor impression on him. Wentworth's contribution to Irish cultural life should not be undervalued. It was under his patronage that the Weirberg Street Theatre, Ireland's first theatre, was opened by John Ogilby, a member of his household, and survived for several years despite the opposition of Archbishop James Usher of Armagh. Um, James Shirley, the English dramatist who wrote several plays of it, one with a distinctively Irish theme, and Langartha by Henry Burnell, the first known play by an Irish dramatist, was produced there in 1640. Wentworth's heavy-handed approach did yield some improvements, as well as contribute to the strength of royal administration in Ireland. His hindrance in 1634 of the Graces, a campaign for equality by Roman Catholics in the Parliament of Ireland, lost him goodwill, but was based on fiscal and not religious principles. Wentworth regarded the proper management of Parliament as a crucial test of his success, and in the short term his ruthless methods did produce results. Having settled on Nathaniel Caitlin as the most suitable speaker, he coerced the voters of Dublin into returning him as a member, and ordered the Commons to elect him as a speaker. The Parliament of 1634-5 did pass some useful legislation. The Act Against Fraudulent Conveyances remained in force into the 21st century. His second Parliament, however, having paid him abject compliments, began to attack his administration as soon as Wentworth left for England. The future Duke of Ormond became Wentworth's chief friend and supporter. Wentworth planned large-scale confiscations of Catholic-owned land, both to raise money for the crown and to break the political power of the Irish Catholic gentry, a policy which Ormond supported. Yet it infuriated Ormond's relatives and drove many of them into opposition to Wentworth and ultimately into armed rebellion. In 1640, 
with Wentworth having been recalled to attend the Second Bishop's War in England, Ormond was made Commander-in-Chief of the Forces in Ireland, Wedgwood concludes that whatever his intentions, Wentworth Stafford in Ireland achieved only one thing, to unite every faction in Ireland in their determination to be rid of him. Wentworth's rule in Ireland made him more high-handed at court than ever. He had never been consulted on English affairs until February 1637, when King Charles asked Wentworth's opinion on a proposed interference in the affairs of the continent. In reply, Wentworth assured Charles it would be unwise to undertake even naval operations till he had secured absolute power at home. He wished that Hampton and his followers, quote, were well whipped into their right senses. The judges had given the king the right to levy ship money, but unless his majesty had, quote, the, like, had, quote, the like power declared to raise a land army, the crown, seemed, quote, to stand upon one leg at home, to be considerable, but by halves, to foreign princes abroad. When the Scottish co Covenanters um, rebelled, when the Scottish Covenanters rebelled, he advocated the most decided measures of repression. In February 1639, sending the king 2,000 pounds as contribution to the expenses of the coming war, and at the same time depreciating an invasion of Scotland before the English army was trained, and advising certain concessions in religion. Wentworth apparently intended to put down roots in Ireland. In late 1630, uh, he was much occupied with building a mansion, Jigginston Castle, near Nass, country Kildare. He is thought to have intended it to be his official residence, where he could entertain the king should he visit Ireland. The castle, which was built partly of red brick and partly of Kilkenny marble, would, had it have been completed, have been probably the largest private house in Ireland. But after Wentworth's death, it quickly fell into ruin, although the ground floor still exists. He made some efforts to build up a network of family alliances in Ireland. His brother George, to whom he was close, married Anne Rush, the sister of Stafford's great friend Eleanor Loftus, and his sister Elizabeth married James Dillon, Earl of Roscommon. Roscommon, unlike most of the Anglo-Irish Anglo nobility, remained staunchly loyal to the king during the Civil War. His son, Wentworth Dillon, 4th Earl of Roscommon, uh, was named his distinguished uncle, and grew up to be a poet of some distinction. Stra Strafford seems to have taken some interest in his nephew's education, and he spent part of his childhood at his uncle, uncle's Yorkshire home. Recall an impeachment. Wentworth was recalled to England in September 1639. He was expected to help sort out the problems that were growing at home, namely bankruptcy and war with the Scottish Covenanters, and became the king's principal advisor. Unaware how much opposition had developed in England during his absence, he recommended the calling of Parliament to support a renewal of the war, hoping that by the offer of a loan from the privy councillors, to which he contributed £20,000, he would save Charles from having to submit to the new Parliament if it proved truculent. Um, the king created him Earl of Stafford in 1640. The Wentworth family seat of Wentworth Woodhouse lay in the hundred of Stafford, uh, Stafforth in the West Riding of Yorkshire, and in March he went to Ireland to hold an Irish Parliament, where the Catholic vote secured a grant of subsidies to be used against the Presbyterian Scots. An Irish army was to be levied to assist in the coming war. When St Strafford returned to England, he found that the Commons were holding back from a grant of supply. So he tried to enlist the peers on the side of the king, and persuaded Charles to be content with a smaller grant than he had originally asked for. From April to August 1640, on his return from Ireland, uh, Stratford occupied the newly built Leicester House, Westminster, in the absence of its owner, Lord Leicester. The Commons insisted on peace with the Scots. Charles, on the advice of, or perhaps by the treachery of, Henry Vane the Elder, uh, returned to his larger demand of 12 subsidies, and on 9th May, at the Privy Council, Stra Strafford, though reluctantly, voted for a dissolution. The same morning, the Committee of Eight of the Privy Council met again. Vane and the others were for a mere defense against invasion. Strafford's advice was to the contrary. Quote, go on vigorously, or let them uh, alone. Go on with a vigorous war, as you first designed. Loose and absolved from all the rules of government, being reduced to extreme necessity. Everything is to be done that the power might admit. You have an army uh, in Ireland you may employ here to reduce this kingdom. He tried to force the citizens of London to lend money, and supported a project for debasing the coinage and seizing bullion in the Tower of London, the property of foreign merchants. He also advocated for the purchase of a loan from Spain by the offer of a future alliance. Strafford was now appointed to command the English army, and was made a Knight of the Garter, but he fell ill at a crucial moment. In the great Council of Peers, which assembled on 24th September at York, the struggle was given up, 
and Charles announced that he had issued writs for, for another parliament. By late 1640, there was no option but to call a new parliament. The Long Parliament assembled on 3rd November 1640, and Charles immediately summoned Strafford to London, promising that, quote, he should not suffer in his person, honour or fortune. One of Parliament's first utterances after its 11-year forced hiatus was to impeach Strafford for high misdemeanours regarding his conduct in Ireland. He arrived on 9th November, and the next day asked Charles to um, forestall his impeachment by accusing the leaders of the popular party of treasonable communications with the Scots. The plan having been betrayed, John Pym immediately took up the impeachment to the House of Lords on 11th November. Strafford came in person to confront his accusers, um, but was ordered to withdraw and taken into custody. On 25th November, his preliminary charge was brought up, whereupon he was sent to the Tower of London, and on 31st January 1641, the accusations in detail were presented. These were that Strafford had tried to subvert the fundamental laws of the kingdom. Much stress was laid on Strafford's repeated words, quote, You have an army in Ireland you may employ here to reduce this kingdom. The failure of impeachment of the bill and the bill of attainder. However tyrannical Strafford's um, earlier conduct may have been, his offence was outside the definition of high treason. Although a flood of complaints poured in from Ireland and Strafford's many enemies were happy to testify against him, None of them could point to any act which was treasonable, as opposed to high-handed. The copy of rough notes of Strafford's speech and the committee of the council obtained from Sir Henry Vane the Younger were validated by councillors who had been present on the occasion, including Henry Vane the Elder, who did ultimately corroborate them, but nearly disowned his son for having found and leaked them in the first place, and partially by Algernon Percy, Earl of Northumberland. This was not evidence which would convict in a court of law, and all parties knew this. Strafford's, Strafford's words, particularly the crucial phrase, this kingdom, had to be arbitrarily interpreted as referring to the subjection of England and not of Scotland, and were also spoken on a privileged occasion. Strafford took full advantage of the weak points in his attack on the evidence collected. Over and over, Strafford pointed to the fundamental weakness in the prosecution. How could it be treason to carry out the king's wishes? The lords, his judges, were influenced in his favour. The impeachment failed on 10th April 1641. Pym and his allies increased published pr public pressure, threatening members of Parliament unless they punished Strafford. The Commons, therefore, feeling their victim slipping from their grasp, dropped the impeachment and brought, and brought in and passed a bill of attainder on 13th April by a vote of 204 to 59. Owing to the opposition of the Lords and Pym's own preference for the more judicial method, the procedure uh, of an impeachment was to be adhered to. Um, few of the Lords felt much personal liking for Strafford, but there was a fair number of moderates, notably Francis Russell, Earl of Bedford, um, who thought that barring him from ever serving the King again was sufficient punishment. The families of his first two wives, the Cliffords and Holises, used all their... Um, um, influence to gain a reprieve. Even Denzil Hollis, first Baron, Baron Hollis, who was implacably hostile to the king, put aside political differences to plead for the life of his favorite sister's husband. Strafford might still have been saved, but for Charles I's ill-advised conduct, a scheme to gain over the leaders of the parliament, and a scheme to seize the Tower of London and to liberate Strafford by force, were entertained concurrently and were mutually destructive. The revelation of the First Army plot on 5th May 1641 called, caused the Lords to reject the submission, submissions in defense of Strafford by Richard Lane and to pass the attainder. Strafford's enemies were implacable in their determination that he should die. In the Earl of Essex's phrase, quote, stone dead hath no fellow, while the view of Oliver St. John was that Strafford should be regarded not a man, but as a dangerous animal who must be, quote, knocked on the head. Uh, nothing now remained but the king's signature. Still, Strafford had served Charles with what the king felt was a high degree of loyalty, and Charles had a serious problem with signing Strafford's death warrant as a matter of conscience, especially as he had explicitly promised Strafford that no matter what happened, he would not die. However, to refuse the will of the parliament on this matter could, be ser could seriously threaten the monarchy. When he summoned the bishops to ask for their advice, they divided. Some, like James Usher, Archbishop of Armagh, argued that the king could not in conscience break his promise to Strafford to spare him. Others, like Bishop John Williams of Lincoln, took the contrary view that the reasons of state permitted the king to break his word where a private citizen could not. Charles had, 
after the passing of the attainder by the commons, for the second time assured Strafford upon the word of a king, you shall not suffer in life, honor, or fortune. Strafford now wrote, um, releasing the king from his... Strafford now wrote, releasing the king from his engagements and declaring his willingness to die to reconcile Charles to his subjects. Quote, I do most humbly beseech you for the preventing of such massacres as may happen by your refusal to pass the bill by this means to remove the unfortunate thing forth of the way towards that blessed agreement which God, I trust, shall forever establish between you and your subjects. Whether Strafford was now resigned to death, or whether he thought that the letter, if circulated, might move his enemies to mercy, is still debated. The king did not release the letter to Parliament. Meanwhile, violent mobs threatened the palace with harm to the queen and her children. The king's inept efforts to overpower Parliament with military force were revealed by Pym, and uh, caused irresistible pressure. Charles gave assent on 10th May, remarking sadly, quote, My Lord Stafford's condition is happier than mine. Accounts of Stafford's reaction when he was told that he must die differ. By one account, he took the news stoically. According to another, he was deeply distressed and said bitterly, Put not your trust in princes. Um, Archbishop Laud wrote that the king's abandonment of Stafford proved to be a, quote, mild and generous prince that knows not how to be or be made great. Abandonment of Strafford, sorry. Archbishop Laud wrote that the king's abandonment of Strafford proved him to be, quote, a mild and, gen and gracious prince that knows not how to be or be made great. Death and Aftermath. Strafford met his fate two days later on Tower Hill, receiving the bl blessing of Archbishop Laud, who went on to be likewise imprisoned in the tower and executed on 10th January 1645. He was executed before a crowd estimated, probably with some exaggeration, at 300,000 on 12th May 1641, as this number was roughly the population of London at the time. The crowd is likely to have been a good deal smaller. Following the news of Strafford's execution, Ireland rose in sanguinary rebellion in October 1641, which led to more bickering between King and Parliament this time over the raising of an army. Any hope that Strafford's death would avert the coming crisis soon vanished. Wedgwood quotes the anonymous protest, quote, They promised us that all shall be well if my lord Strafford's head were off, since when there is nothing better. Many of Strafford's Irish enemies, like Lord Cork, found that his removal had put their estates and even their lives at risk. When Charles I himself was executed eight years later, among his last words were that God had permitted his execution as punishment for his consenting to Strafford's death. Quote, that unjust sentence which I suffered to take in effect. In 1660, the House of Lords voted to expunge the record of Strafford's attainder from its official journal with the intention of repudiating its legal val validity. Assessment. In the course of his career, he made many enemies who pursued him with a remarkable mixture of fear and hatred to his death. Yet Strafford was capable of inspiring strong friendships in private life. At least three men who served him in Ireland, Christopher Wandesford, George Radcliffe, and Guildford Slingsby, remained his loyal friends to the end. Wentworth's last letter to Slingsby before his execution shows an emotional warmth uh, with which he is not often credited. Sir Thomas Rowe speaks of him as, quote, severe abroad in, and in business, and sweet in private conversation, retired in his friendships but very firm, a terrible judge, and a strong enemy. He was a good husband and a devoted father. His appearance is described by Sir Philip Warwick in, quote, In his person, he was of tall stature, but stooped much in the neck. His countenance was cloudy whilst he moved or sat thinking, but when he spoke, either seriously or facetiously, he had a lightsome and very pleasant air, and indeed when he then did, performed, when he, then did he performed very gracefully. He himself jested on his own, quote, bent and ill-favored brow. Lord Exeter replying that he had been, quote, cursed with a meek brow and an arch of white hair upon it, uh, he would never have governed Ireland nor Yorkshire. Despite his terrifying manner, there is no real evidence that he was physically violent. Even the most serious charge against him, that he ill-treated Robert Esmond, causing his death, rests on disputed testimony. Thomas was the subject of a verse play by the poet Robert Browning, entitled Strafford, 1837. Family. Strafford was married three times to Margaret Clifford, um, for daughter of Francis Clifford, 4th Earl of Cumberland, to Arabella Hollis, daughter of John Hollis, 1st Earl of Clare, um, and to Elizabeth Rhodes, daughter of Sir Godfrey Rhodes. 
Uh, Strafford's honours were forfeited by Zetainder, but his only son, William, who was born on 8th June 1626, received them all by fresh grant from Charles I on 1st December 1641. In 1662, Parliament reversed his father's attainder, and William, already 1st Earl of Strafford uh, of the Second Creation, became also 2nd Earl of the First Creation in succession to his father. In addition to William, Strafford and Arabella had two daughters who outlived him, Anne, born October 1627, who married Edward Watson, 2nd Baron Rockingham, and Arabella, born October 1630, who married Justin McCarthy, Viscount Mount Cashel. Through his, daughters Anne, uh, through his daughter Anne, Strafford was the ancestor of the prominent 18th century statesman Charles Watson Wentworth, 2nd Marquess of Rockingham. He had a daughter, Margaret, with his third wife. The hatred felt by so many for Strafford did not extend to his widow and children, who were, genuinely, who were generally regarded with compassion. Even at the height of the Civil War, Parliament treated, quote, that poor, unfortunate family with consideration.